now dealing with count two. The summary of the evidence of substantial facts in terms of section 1443A of Act 51 of 1977 reads as follows. In January 2013, the accused, while having lunch with friends at a restaurant in Melrose Ark in Johannesburg, handled the firearm of one of his friends and a shot was discharged. This shot narrowly, narrowly missed his friend and hit the floor of the restaurant. The, friends referred to, the friend referred to in this paragraph is Kevin Lerin. The state called two witnesses to prove this count. Samantha Taylor, I'll have to rephrase, I'm not talking about count two, count three, I'm talking about count three. I'll have to rephrase, I'm talking about count, three, count two instead of count three. The summary of substantial facts in terms of section 1443A of Act 51 of 1977 reads as follows. On a separate occasion, on 20 September 2010, the accused who is the licensed owner of a nine millimeter pistol fired a shot through the sunroof of a car while traveling on a public road. There were other passengers in that car. The state called two witnesses for this count, namely Samantha Taylor, former girlfriend of the accused, and Darren Fresco, who was a friend of the accused. Both these witnesses were present in the vehicle when the incident referred to in this count occurred. Ms. Taylor's evidence briefly was that she, Darren Fresco, and the accused were returning from a visit at the Val River one afternoon when the vehicle they were traveling in was stopped by traffic officers for speeding. Fresco was the driver at the time while the traffic officer was writing an infringement ticket. The accused, who occupied the front passenger seat, stepped out of the vehicle to see what was happening with Fresco. A second officer had in the meantime walked to the front passenger seat where the accused had left his firearm. The officer picked it up asking whose it was and where the owner and whether the owner had a license and in the process ejected a bullet into the vehicle. The accused returned and had a verbal altercation with the officer. After they had searched for and found the bullet, they left the scene. Both the accused and Fresco, who were still driving, were irritated by the officers, and minutes later, they joked about whether they should or should not shoot at a robot. The accused took his firearm and shot through the open sunroof of the vehicle. Both Fresco and the accused laughed about the incident. Ms. Taylor could not say where the incident happened as she was not familiar with the vicinity. Mr. Fresco confirmed that the incident took place although his version was very different. He, the accused, and Miss Taylor were traveling in one vehicle on their way from an outing at the Val River. He was the driver. 
the accused sat in the front passenger seat while Ms. Taylor occupied the back seat. He confirmed that they were stopped by traffic officers twice, once for speeding. He was asked by the officer to step outside, which he did. And while the officer was writing him a ticket, the accused left his seat to join him. Another officer went to the front passenger seat where he found the accused firearm, picked it up, and ejected the bullet in the process. This action irritated the accused, who rebuked the officer for handling, I quote, another man's <coughs> firearm, close quote. He told the officer that his fingerprints were all over the firearm, and if anything were to happen, he, the officer, would be held responsible. They left the scene soon thereafter. Without warning, the accused took out his firearm and fired a shot into the air through the open sunroof. He asked the accused what he was doing. That is, Fresco asked the accused what he was doing, but he laughed at him. He denied that the incident happened in the manner described by Taylor. His version was that he was very angry at what the accused had done as his left ear was, was left bleeding as a result. The accused denied that he had anything, he had said anything to the officer about fingerprints on the firearm. He stated that he had explained to the officer that he had left the firearm on the seat simply because he did not want to approach a police officer with a firearm on him. The police officer who had ejected the bullet from his firearm was the one who was irritate, irritated and not him. The accused also denied that he fired a shot through the open sunroof. the assessment of the evidence. In respect of count two, it was pointed out by counsel for the accused that Taylor and Fresco contradicted each other regarding the allegation that the accused had fired a shot through the sunroof of their vehicle. For that reason, none of the evidence led by the state in this regard was re reliable, it was, it was argued. On the other hand, the state council, state council disagreed, submitting that there was no reason why Fresco or Taylor would want to falsely implicate the accused. To deal with the submissions above, it is necessary to scrutinize the evidence of the two witnesses. Both Fresco and Taylor gave evidence implicating the accused they both said that on their way from the VAL, the accused fired a shot through the sunroof while the vehicle was moving. However, there the similarities ended. <laughs> they were both there with the accused at the time of the incident. Yet their version on where the incident happened, how it happened, and why it happened are so dissimilar that one may be tempted to think that they were in fact talking about different incidents. I shall proceed with each of these witnesses in turn. Fresco was not an impressive witness at all when he gave evidence regarding this count. In fact, he was proved to be a dishonest witness. 
He gave evidence that on their way to the Val on the day of the incident, the accused had driven the vehicle at a speed in excess of two, 200 kilometers per hour, and alleged that he had taken a photograph of the speedometer at the time. Under cross-examination, it emerged that, in fact, he is the one who drove at an excessive speed of 260 kilometers per hour, and there was an image captured on his phone <coughs> to prove it. The effect of those lies must not be misunderstood. Mendacity on one aspect of a witness's evidence does not necessarily mean that the rest of the evidence will be tainted. It simply means that caution is warranted. In this case, however, there is more reason for the exercise of caution. <coughs> Firstly, Fresco could not with certainty say where the incident happened. During evidence in chief, he stated that he was able to point out the specific spot where the incident had happened to the police and made reference to what was depicted in photographs 1143 to 1146. Under cross-examination, however, he stated that when he was taken to the scene to point out the exact spot where the incident had happened, he was able to point it out only after Captain Van Aert had driven past the location no less than four occasions. Secondly, he told an unlikely, unlikely story that while they were driving back from the Val, after their vehicle had been stopped by Metro Police, the accused, who was a passenger at the time, without any warning, had fired a shot through the sunroof. When he asked him what he was doing, he just laughed at him. Taylor was a former girlfriend of the accused. It is common cause that the relationship between the two did not end amicably. Taylor alleged that the relationship ended when the accused was unfaithful to her. The accused also made a similar counter accusation. It was clear from the evidence of Taylor that she had been hurt by the manner in which the relationship had terminated. The above, however, does not necessarily mean that she was out to falsely implicate the accused. It simply means, like the evidence of Fresco, Taylor's evidence needs to be approached with a certain degree of caution and this court has certainly done that. According to Taylor, after the three of them had left the place where their vehicle had been stopped by Metro Police, Fresco and the accused laughed and they said they wanted to shoot at a robot. And, I quote, then Oscar shot a bullet out of the sunroof, close quote. Unlike Fresco's version that without saying anything out of the blue, the accused simply shot out of the sunroof, <coughs> Taylor's version has a ring of truth. In a criminal case, however, that is never the end of the matter. The question is always whether the state has proved its case against the accused beyond reasonable doubt. The accused denied the incident. Defense counsel correctly stated that even if it were to be found that the accused was a poor witness, that fact would not assist the state case as the, as the court would then be faced with three poor witnesses. This court does not have to believe the accused version 
He bears no onus to prove his innocence. Rather, it is the state which has to persuade this court that the accused is guilty beyond reasonable doubt of the crime with which he's been charged. The state witnesses contradicted each other on crucial aspects, namely the circumstances under which the shot was fired, when and where exactly the shot was fired. The evidence placed before this court falls short of the required standard for a conviction in a criminal matter. This court's conclusion is that the state has failed to establish that the accused is guilty beyond reasonable doubt of this count and has to be acquitted. I'm now dealing with count three, paragraph seven of the summary of substantial facts in terms of section 144.3a of Act 52 of 1977 reads as follows. In January 2013, the accused, while having lunch with friends at a restaurant, in Melrose Ark in Johannesburg, handled the firearm of one of his friends and a shot was discharged. This shot narrowly missed his friend and hit the floor of the restaurant. The friend that is being referred to in this case is Kevin Lirina. It is not in dispute that the firearm, a Glock pistol which belonged to Fresco, discharged while in possession of the accused after he had asked Fresco to pass him his firearm under the table. Kevin Lerina, a boxer, gave evidence that he had Fresco, as he handed over the firearm, tell the accused that there was, I quote, one up, close quote, meaning there was a bullet up in the chamber. Within seconds, the firearm was discharged. The shot damaged the floor very close to him and his toe was injured by shrapnel. However, the accused was concerned at that moment that someone might have been hurt and apologized. He asked if everyone was fine. He then asked Fresco to take the blame for what had happened as he wanted to avoid bad publicity in the media. Fresco, in his evidence, confirmed that the accused had asked to see his firearm. He confirmed that he also passed it on to him under the table, that as he did so, he told the accused that there was one up, that the accused took the firearm and that soon thereafter the firearm discharged. Fresco also confirmed that the accused asked him to take the blame for the discharge of the firearm. When the owners approached that table to seek an explanation, he told, the, he told them that his firearm had discharged when it got caught in the leg of his tracksuit and fell onto the floor. Mr. Lopez, the owner of Touches Restaurant, gave evidence that on the day of the incident, the restaurant was full with approximately 220 patrons. It was lunchtime at the time, and he was busy, busy with patrons when he heard a loud bang that sounded like a gunshot. When he went to investigate, Fresco apologized and told him that his firearm had accidentally fallen off his trouser. Soon thereafter, the group paid the bill. 
the accused and those in his company <coughs> apologized and left. The accused admitted that he took the firearm from Fresco after he had asked for it. He had wanted to see it as he was planning to buy a similar model. His version was that at the time he took it, he did not realize that the firearm was loaded or that it had a magazine in it. He wanted to make it safe when a shot went off accidentally. Counsel for the defense sought to explain in his submission what might have caused the firearm to discharge. In my view, it really does not matter what caused the firearm to discharge, as that will not assist this court in determining whether the accused was negligence. No one has submitted that there was intention on the part of the accused. What is relevant is that the accused asked for a firearm in a restaurant full of patrons and that while it was in his possession, it discharged. He may not have intentionally pulled the trigger. However, that in itself does not absolve him of the crime of neg negligently handling a firearm in circumstances where it creates a risk to the safety of people and property and not to take reasonable precautions to avoid the danger. The version of Fresco was supported in, mat in material respects by that of Lerina. Although Lerina did not know why the firearm was passed from Fresco to the accused, he had Fresco tell the accused there was one up. After the firearm had discharged, he also had the accused ask Fresco to take the blame for the incident. The accused version, on the other hand, was that he was angry with Fresco for having handed him a loaded firearm. He reprimanded him for doing so as people could have got hurt it is strange that this portion of the accused version was never put to either Lerina or to Fresco. An inference is irresistible that no such conversation took place at all. <coughs> Lerina was a good witness and I did not detect any indication of bias against the accused. This court was given no reason to reject his evidence and that evidence is accepted in total as true and reliable. It follows, it follows therefore that this court also accepts the evidence of Fresco in this regard. From the evidence led through Mr. Renz in respect of count one, the accused was sufficiently trained in the use of firearms, and that would include the responsible handling of firearms. <coughs> he should not therefore have asked for a firearm in a public place such as a restaurant full of patrons, let alone handle it. In my view, the state has proved beyond reasonable doubt that the accused contravened section 120, subsection 3B of the Act. <coughs> In respect of count four, the state alleges that the accused contravened Section 90 read with other relevant sections of the Firearms Act by unlawfully possessing 38 times 38 rounds of ammunition at his house at 286 
Bush Willow Street, Silverwood's Country Estate, Sil Silver Lake, without any right to possess the said ammunition. It is convenient at this stage to deal first with the relevant law. Section 90 of the Firearms Control Act 60 of 2000, the Firearms Act provides, I quote, 90, prohibition of possession of ammunition. No person may possess any ammunition unless he or she, A, holds a license in respect of a firearm capable of discharging that ammunition, B, holds a, a permit to possess ammunition, C, holds a dealer's license, manufacturer's license, gunsmith license, import, expect, or in transit permit or transporter's permit issued in terms of this act, or D, is otherwise authorized to do so, close quote. Section 121A of the Firearms Act provides as follows. I quote, one, a person is guilty of an offense if he or she contravenes or fails to comply with any A, provision of, he, of this act, close quote. The accused made admissions in terms of section 220 of the CPA that he did not possess a license to possess the ammunition found at his house, but denied that he contravened the act. Counsel for the defense submitted that possession means there must be the physical detention and an intention to possess at the same time. In other words, there must be, in addition to detention, animus. In support of this submission, he relied on the matter of S. Visi Squanda, 2013, Volume 1, SACR 137, in brackets, SCA. In that matter, the appellant appealed against the dismissal by a high court of an appeal against his conviction on charges of possession of arms and ammunition in contravention of sections 32.1a and 32.1e of the Arms and Ammunition Act 75 of 1969. At the time of his arrest, he was the driver of a vehicle that was conveying him and two others to rob a bank. Sitting next to the appellant in the vehicle was another man who carried an AK-47 rifle and ammunition. It was not clear whether the appellant was aware of the firearm in his companion's possession. The companion absconded during the course of the trial. The only question was whether the state had established that the appellant possessed the firearm jointly with his companion. The court held, accepting that the appellant had conspired with his companions to commit robbery, and even aware that some of his co-accused possessed firearms for the purpose of committing the robbery, such knowledge on his part was not sufficient to establish that he had the intention to jointly possess the firearm and ammunition. Accordingly, the conviction, conviction on the firearms, firearms charges were set aside. From the above, it is clear that the state must prove that the accused had the necessary mental intention, animus, a, a firearm, or to possess the firearm before they can be 
a conviction. I'll reread that. From the above, it is clear that the state must prove that the accused had the necessary mental intention, in brackets, animus, to possess a firearm or ammunition before there can be a conviction. That it is quite possible to possess a firearm innocently is clear from the fact that if a person who has no license to, to possess a firearm were to pick up a firearm from where the owner had forgotten it solely with an intention to return it to its owner, it would be an aberration of justice if he were to be convicted of possession of a firearm as he clearly lacked intention to possess it in the legal sense. In this regard, C.S. v. Majigazana, 2012, Volume 2, SACR 107, in brackets, SCA. In the present case, counsel for the state made much of the fact that the accused father refused to make an affidavit confirming that the ammunition found in the possession of the accused belonged to him. In my view, that does not assist the, the state. The accused version is that the am ammunition belonged to his father and that he had no intention to possess it. The fact that there is no corroboration for the accused version does not assist at all. Accordingly, what the state needed to do was to introduce evidence to the contrary. It did not do so. The accused version, therefore, remains uncontroverted. The state has failed to prove that the accused had the necessary animus to possess the ammunition. He therefore cannot be found guilty on this count. In conclusion, I'd like to recap on the four counts that the accused has been found guilty of. Count one. In respect of count one, the allegation was that the accused and the deceased had an argument that the deceased ran and locked herself in the toilet, and that the accused followed her there and fired shots at her through the locked door. Three shots struck her and she died as a result. Evidence led by the state in respect of this count was purely circumstantial. It was not strong circumstantial evidence. Moreover, the evidence of various witnesses who gave evidence on, on what they heard, in what sequence, and, and when, proved to be unreliable. The accused denied the allegations, notwithstanding that he was an unimpressive witness, the accused gave a version which could reasonably possibly be true. In criminal law, that is all that is required for an acquittal as the owners to prove the guilt of an accused beyond reasonable doubt rests with the state throughout. The version of the accused was that he fired shots at the toilet door because he thought there was an intruder inside the toilet. The sequence of events, namely the shots, the screams, the shouts of help, the sound of a cricket bag striking against the toilet roll, the toilet door, the calls made by various witnesses to security to report screams and or shots are more in line with the version of the accused. Although it is not necessary for the state to prove motive, there is no basis on which this court could make inferences of why the accused would want to kill the deceased. In addition, there is 
objective evidence in the form of phone, rec phone records. This too supports the version of the accused. Furthermore, their conduct of the accused shortly after the incident is inconsistent with the conduct of someone who had intention to commit murder. He acted promptly in seeking help soon after the incident. He shouted for help. He called a friend stander. He called 911. He called security, although he could not speak as he was crying. He prayed to God to save the deceased's life. He was seen trying to resuscitate the deceased, and he pleaded with Dr. Stipp to help, and he was distraught. From the above, it cannot be said that the accused did not entertain a genuine belief that there was an intruder in the toilet who posed a threat to him. Therefore, he could not be found guilty of murder, dolus directus. This court has already found that the accused cannot be guilty of murder dolus eventualis either on the basis that from his belief and his conduct, it could not be said that he foresaw that either the deceased or anyone else for that matter might be killed when he fired the shots at the toilet door. It also cannot be said that he accepted the possibility or that possibility into the bargain. I might just add that in respect of the first leg of the test, in Dolus Eventualis, a virtual and hand principles of general principles of criminal law states the following on page three seven one. The courts have warned against any tendency to draw the inference of subjective foresight too easily. For example, in S. v. Bradshaw, 1977, Volume 1, PH, H60, capital A in brackets, Vessels J.A. stated, I quote, the court should guard against proceeding too readily from, single quote, ought to have foreseen, close quote, to, open single quote, must have foreseen, close single quote, and thence to, open single quote, by necessary inference, in fact, foresaw, close quote. The possible consequences of the conduct being inquired into. The several thought processes attributed to an accused must be established beyond any reasonable doubt. Having due regard to the particular circumstances which attended the conduct being inquired into. Close quote. And in S. Vices Sequatra, 1967, Volume 4, S.A. 566, capital A in brackets, Holmes J.A. expressed the degree of proof in the following terms. I quote, subjective foresight, like any other factual issue, may be proved by inference to constitute proof beyond reasonable doubt. The inference must be the only one which can reasonably be drawn. It cannot be drawn so, it, it cannot be so drawn if there is a reasonable possibility that subjectively the accused did not foresee, even if he ought reasonably to have done so, and even if he probably did do so." Close quote. Uh. 
Evidential material before this court, however, <coughs> show that the accused acted neg negligently when he fired shots into the toilet door, knowing that there was someone behind the door and that there was very little room in which to maneuver. A reasonable person, therefore, in the position of the accused with similar disability, would have foreseen that the possibility, that possibility that whoever was behind the door might be killed by the shots and would have taken steps to avoid the consequences and the accused in this matter failed to take those consequences. I'm dealing with count two in a summary form. In this count, the state alleged that in September 2012, while driving in a vehicle with other passengers on a public road, the accused unlawfully discharged a firearm without good reason to do so by firing a shot with a 9 millimeter pistol through the open sunroof. The alternative count is that the accused discharged the firearm to wit his 9 millimeter pistol with regard for the other passengers with disregard for the other passengers in the car and or in the vicinity. On this count, the state failed to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. In respect of count three, the state alleged that in January 2013 at Church's restaurant, a public place, the accused unlawfully discharged a firearm to wit, a Glock 27 pistol, without any good reasons to do so. The first alternative is that at the same place on the same day, the accused negligently used a firearm to wit, a Glock 27 pistol, and caused damage to the floor of the restaurant. The second alternative to this count is that at the same place and the same day, the accused discharged a firearm to wit, a Glock pistol at a table in the restaurant among other pa patrons in a manner likely to endanger the safety of the people at his table and or other patrons and the property of the restaurant. The accused had in discharging the firearm mentioned shown a reckless disregard for the safety of the patrons of the property of the restaurant. Count four, the allegation was that on about 16 February 2013 at or near 286 Bush, Bush Willow Street, Silver Woods, Country Estate, Silver Lakes, in Pretoria, the accused was unlawfully in possession of ammunition to wit 38 38.38 rounds without being the holder of a license in respect of a firearm capable of discharging that ammunition, a permit to possess ammunition, a dealer's license, gunsmith license, import, export, or in transit permit, or transporter's permit issued in terms of the Firearm Control Act number 60 of 2000, or is otherwise authorized to do so. In respect of this count, the state failed to prove beyond reasonable doubt all the elements of the charge. Mr. Pistorius, please stand up. <clears throat> Having regard to the totality of this evidence in this matter, the unanimous decision of this court is the following. One, on count one, murder read with section 
51.1 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act, 105 of 1997, the accused is found not guilty and is discharged. Instead, he is found guilty of culpable homicide. On count two, contravention of section 120, 127 of the Firearms Control Act, number 60 of 2000, and the alternative count that is contravention of section 120, 3B of the same act, the accused is found not guilty and discharged. On count three, contravention of section 120, subsection seven, alternatively count 120, subsection 3A, and further alternatively, section 120, subsection 3B of the Firearms Control Act, number 60 of 2000, the accused is found guilty of the second alternative, that is the contravention of section 120, 3B. On count four, contravention of section 90 of the Firearms Control Act number 60 of 2000, the accused is found not guilty and discharged. Um, you may take a seat, Mr. Pistorius. We proved no previous convictions. Thank you. Before, before I even ask counsel to address me, I need to address the issue of uh, the indemnity of Mr. Fresco. Yes, good, please. not putting on my rug, it's very hot in court. No, I understand. I don't know when my lady was going to address the issue. Yes, yes. Before, before I even address the, that issue, I need to tell you that um, both Mr. Nell and Mr. Rue have already addressed me on that issue. It, I'm giving you a choice. You may address me if you so wish. My lady, I don't think it's any need for that. Uh, my lady really made a judgment on the credibility of Mr. Fresco, relating specifically to that charge. And my only contention is going to be that I'll leave it in the hands of the court. We are happy and will abide with my lady's decision in the matter. Thank you very much. It is convenient at this stage to deal with the question of whether Mr. Fresco as a sec section 204 witness is entitled to indemnity. In terms of section 204, subsection 2 of the Criminal Procedure Act, I quote, if a witness referred to in subsection 1 in the opinion of the court answers frankly and honestly all questions put to him, A, such witness shall, subject to the provisions of subsection 3, be discharged from prosecution for the offense so specified by the prosecutor and for any offense in respect of which a verdict of guilty would be competent upon a charge relating to the offense so specified. And B, the court shall cause such discharge to be entered on the record of the proceedings in question, close quote. It is important to emphasize that Mr. Fresco was warned in respect of count three only. The question is whether or not he should be discharged from the prosecution 
in respect of count three. Counsel for the defense submitted that Fresco was not entitled to a discharge from prosecution in terms of sections of the section set out above for a number of, a number of reasons. He submitted into earlier the following. One, Fresco's evidence was contradictory and improbable, if not impossible, in demonstrating the proximity of his head to that of the accused when he was informing the accused that the firearm was one up. Two, Fresco may have been an accomplice as he handed a loaded firearm to the accused in a restaurant without warning. For that reason, his evidence needed to be approached with caution. Three, Fresco had given false evidence in relation to the sun roof incident in count two. That would disqualify him as a witness whose evidence this court could not rely on. Four, in his section 204 affidavit, Mr. Fresco had failed to, men to mention that the accused had asked him to take the blame for the incident. It was unlikely that the error lay with counsel who assisted him prepare such an affidavit. It was more likely that the omission was a result of Fresco's dishonesty, it was argued. State counsel made submissions to the contrary. It was his submission that Fresco answered questions put to him frankly and honestly, and that he qualified for indemnity in terms of section 204, subsection 2 of the CPA. It is so that Fresco may have been an accomplice and that there may have been contradictions in his evidence. Not all contradictions, <coughs> however, are serious. The weight to be attached to a, con a contradiction would <coughs> depend on the nature of the contradiction, the reason why there is a contradiction, and the frequency or the number of the contradictions. <coughs> there is a possibility that a witness may be mistaken about something and courts are equipped to deal with this failing fairly, fairly having regard to the evidence as a whole. There is no reason why the evidence from a section 204 witness should be treated differently in my view. The contradictions relating to count three were minor and immaterial considering that there is very little that is in dispute. It was clear that Fresco was not out to falsely implicate the accused. He merely stated a fact, which was the firearm discharged while in the possession of the accused. Fresco never stated that the accused had intentionally discharged a shot. Rather, he was fair to the accused and gave him credit where it was warranted. Counsel for the defense correctly pointed out that Fresco confirmed a number of times that the accused was shocked and that he was apologetic after the firearm had gone off. This court was mindful of the fact that Fresco was a section 204 witness and that his evidence ought to be approached with caution. Also borne in mind was the fact that Fresco was dishonest in the sunroof incident. The fact that a witness was dishonest in one respect, however, does not render his evidence as a whole unreliable. In the present case, Fresco's evidence was corroborated by that of Lerina in material respects. <laughs> Lastly, 
the submission that because an affidavit was settled by two lawyers, it should have no errors or omissions, and that if there are any, it, should, it could only be because the witness failed to disclose the information has no merit. No one is infallible, not even lawyers. Having regard to the foregoing, it is the opinion of this court that Mr. Darren Fresco answered frankly and honestly all questions put to him. One, accordingly, he is discharged from prosecution for the offense specified in the indictment as count three. He is also discharged from prosecution for any offense in respect of which a verdict of guilty would be competent upon a charge relating to the offense specified as count three. Two, the discharge of Mr. Darren Fresco shall be entered on the record of these proceedings. So just take a five minutes break. Mm -hmm. and, maybe, and maybe maybe see your chambers just yes. on the aspect. Yes, that, that is in order.
I used to hunt. I'm back at it. I'm going to be a little bit more to the world. 